千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. As always, I want to extend my welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware, as we are ready ourselves for this sacred process in the Tao with one another. The best place to begin introducing the Tao Te Ching is with the title Tao Te Ching itself. When you hear me speak, you can hear that the sound I make is not Tao Te Ching. It's always Tao Te Ching, which is the original pronunciation. So why is it that Tao Te Ching, spelled with a T, should really sound like Dao De Jing. Well, we can delve into that. But first, what does the title mean? The three characters Dao De Jing should be translated as the Dao and Virtue Classic. That's it. You have probably seen the title translated many other ways. Currently, Wikipedia presents seven variations of title translation. I am here to tell everyone that none of the seven measures up to the standard of accuracy that you see right here in this simple slide. So let's break down the three characters. The first character to the left that you see here that's the Tao. You see it repeated in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. So we have that character, Tao, in every slide. Then the middle character, De, it means virtue, translated as virtue. And then finally, the last character there, Jing, translated as classic. So I say rather boldly that this is the way it should be translated. Let me explain myself and make my case. First, the character, the Tao, should be translated as the Tao. Now, I have talked about how the Tao, the Chinese character, it means the path or the way, even though that's what it means. Tao means the way. The way is not the best translation for the Tao. It sounds like I have just contradicted myself there. And this warrants an explanation. The reason why this character should be translated as the Tao is because Tao, T-A-O, has become part of contemporary English it has been part of modern English for years and years. It is used in many different ways. For instance, you probably know of a movie called The Tao of Steve. It doesn't need to be called The Way of Steve. Everybody knows what the title of the movie means. There is a book called The Tao of Warren Buffett. The book title is not The Way of Warren Buffett. It would make sense, but it is not necessary. Many other titles, many other books have similar titles. There's a book called The Tao of Sobriety, The Tao of Willie, about Willie Nelson, The Tao of Dating, and so on. The reason why it is a usable word 
in English is because linguistically it's a Chinese loan word. There are many loan words from different languages in English. A well known example is the French loan word deja vu. Deja means already. Vu literally means seen. Deja vu is already seen. So think about this. You may say to your friends, oh, I just had a deja vu moment, or you see something that, that uh, rings a bell for you mentally. So you turn to the others and you say, whoa, that was a bit of deja vu there. Do people know what you mean? Yes, they may not necessarily speak French, but they know the French loan word. You don't need to say, whoa, that was a already seen moment. You wouldn't say that, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. In the same way, the Tao can be just the Tao. It's a loan word. It's been in use for quite some time. It's actually not the best translation to render it as the way. So that's why you see the Tao there. What about the second character, De? De means virtue. It's not a long word like a Tao. So it should just be translated as virtue. The English word virtue happens to have a very good match semantically to the Chinese character. It covers the meaning, the dual meaning in the Chinese, which is also about, number one, a human goodness, like the virtue of compassion, and number two, an inherent power, like by virtue of something. Because of the good match, the English word virtue is the best way to translate de, other translators have tried to tweak this in various ways, and it's never the best way. It is quite popular for some to talk about the as power, as in the inherent power part of the definition. But when you translate the as power, you're missing out on the other part, the human goodness part. So it's not the best translation. Same thing with the English word integrity. In integrity qualifies as a human goodness, but then you're missing out on the inherent power part of it. You would say by virtue of something, like by, by virtue of being studious, I knew the answer. You wouldn't say by integrity of being studious, I knew the answer. You just wouldn't. So neither power nor integrity would be the best translation. It's just virtue. And I would say, guys, we can just keep it simple here. No need to dance around it. People maybe don't like the word virtue because it maybe sounds a little bit like Maybe it sounds preachy, but that's what it is. Lastly, Jing, it should be translated as classic, not book. To translate Jing as book would be a suboptimal translation as well. There's a word in Chinese, Shu, that corresponds exactly to book. Jing would be like a sutra or a classic. It's a work that's been passed down through the generations as a distillation of wisdom. It's not just a book. It's more than a book. So for these reasons, I say that all of the popular translations presented in many sources like Wikipedia are actually not very accurate. Now, it's okay that people know what you're talking about when you're using a different title, but 
as we just have heard in 81, I want to present xin yan, words that people can believe in, as in the truth or as close to the truth as we can get in human communication. Now, the seven variations of title translation I talked about, they mostly come from uh, academia. As with all human endeavors, there's a certain degree of closed-minded dogmatic attitude there as well. So I don't think anything that I have said so far will find a receptive audience in that regard. Of course, that doesn't change the truth. So I am still going to be sticking to the Tao and Virtue classic. It's all the more important when you realize that Tao Te Ching is subdivided into two volumes, Tao Jing and Te Ching. So when we translate it in this fashion, I can easily break it down into the Tao classic and the Virtue classic. That's the power of accuracy. Whereas if you say the book of the way and its power, you get you end up with something that's even more distorted, like the book of the way, and then the other section, the book of its power. And the book of its power, it doesn't stand alone because it's it's got the ITS in there. It's not that great. So the table that you see at the bottom here shows the different spelling for the romanization of the of the three characters. Dao De Jing, there's the Wade Giles romanization system on top. That's the first system ever devised. It's the one that we use because of tradition. And then the new one, it looks like it sounds. It's the pinyin system, Dao De Jing. So regardless of how it is spelled, it is supposed to sound like the one, the lower one, the bottom row, Dao De Jing, with the D sound and the J sound. Why? Why the difference in spelling? So let me just give a very brief overview of history. Wade Giles Romanization, it was the first system ever devised to type out Chinese words in English. And it began more than 100 years ago. It was created by, created by British diplomats because they were colonizing parts of China, specifically Hong Kong. So they were created by British diplomats for the practical purpose of communication. The Wade part is Sir Thomas Francis Wade. He lived from 1818 to 1895. So this is over a hundred years ago. He was not a linguist. He was a diplomat and therefore the system that he created was unnecessarily complex because he really didn't know that much about linguistics. In the Way Giles Romanization, you end up with a table that looks like this. This is a simplified version of the bigger table, and it's already so complex that it makes people's heads spin. In the Way Giles Romanization, they make the distinction of unaspirated versus aspirated. And that's about the sound that you make with a particular character. So you see two rows there, unaspirated, aspirated. I'll explain exactly what that means and how it results in issues. There are rules associated with Wei Giles Romanization these are unique rules used nowhere else and unknown to most. These rules were started by, as I mentioned, British diplomat Sir Thomas Francis Wade, later on refined 
by another diplomat, British diplomat as well, Herbert Giles, who lived from 1845 to 1935. He refined the system, he used the same rules because frankly, at the time, the system was the only one available. There were no other system. The rules that he went with ended up being understood only by a few academics and not by the general public. So this is what I'll point out. You only had to focus on two things here. The unaspirated T is supposed to sound like D, the D sound, the Dao. It's spelled with a T. If you wanted to say the aspirated T, T, you would need to put an apostrophe next to it. This is the unique rule used nowhere else. Same thing with Jing. Unaspirated Jing is supposed to sound like J, as you can see there in the other circle. If you wanted the CH sound as normally found in English, like change, you would need to put an apostrophe next to it. That's crazy. Here's what it means. Dao De Jing without the apostrophes is spelled correctly and was always meant to sound with the D sound out with the D sound and the J sound. The what people say when they misread it as Tao Te Ching because they don't know these original rules, it's a mispronunciation that should have been spelled with apostrophes. If you see that misspelling there, that would be what Tao Te Ching really looks like in Wei Giles' romanization. That's why it's a mistake. This system is so, so unknown, so problematic that it was inevitable another system would come along to replace it. And that's the Pinyin romanization system. It's a system currently in active use in the Chinese speaking parts of the world. It is an attempt to simplify. So whereas the Wei Giles romanization system was created by British diplomats, the Pinyin romanization is created by Chinese scholars. It resolves the issue that you see in the table. So Dao De Jing looks like it sounds. This system is expected to be the standard going forward, but I gotta tell you one thing. I have to speak another rather unbeautiful truth. The system resolves some issues while creating new ones. Wei Zhao's romanization system had problems because its creators did not really know English, uh, sorry, did not really know Chinese. The Pin Romanization has the opposite problem. The Chinese scholars who created the system were not native speakers of English. So the problems that it has results from that. So anyhow, that is the reason why there are different spellings. Now you know. Beyond the title, I would like to talk about Lao Zi. His name is spelled in two different ways. I'm sure you have seen it. Looks like this. Same table provides you with the Wei Giles romanization, the original, and then the new system, the pinyin, with the two characters. So basically, same situation, the old system versus the new system. But let's look beyond the, the way the name is spelled, now that we understand the reasoning. Let's talk about who he was. Who was Lao Zi? In the Dao De Jing and the associated Dao teachings of the time, Lao Zi was revealed in three different aspects, beginning with Lao Zi, the scholar. His name was Li Er. Li, 
is the surname, the first character there. It is actually the same Lee as Bruce Lee, but new Romanization system, Pinyin, renders the same characters as L-I instead of L-E-E. L-E-E is the old Wei Jiao system. So he's got this name, Li Er. Now, he became extremely knowledgeable. He was the one that took the position, the royal archivist of the Zhou dynasty, Zhou Chao. And it was in the final days of the Zhou dynasty that he acted, that he had that position as the royal archivist. Not just anyone could be the royal archivist. You had to be the best scholar of your time to qualify for that position. So he definitely had knowledge. It's ironic because in the Tao Te Ching, he spoke against knowledge. Now, he was not against knowledge by itself, but he was against definitely book knowledge, which uh, in Tao philosophy is a dead kind of knowledge. Knowledge from books that has not been applied to life are the dead leftovers of the ancients. This is not just from Laozi, but also from Zhuangzi and the other Tao sages. Bottom line, he was so knowledgeable that he transcended knowledge and then spoke against the obsessive accumulation of knowledge. The second aspect of Laozi to talk about is Laozi, the teacher. According to legend, Confucius regarded Laozi as his master. Indeed, historian Sima Qian recorded their interactions. He recorded for historical records that the two had met, that Confucius learned from Laozi. And Laozi taught him quite a few things, some of which were quoted. For instance, Laozi spoke to Confucius, seeing that Confucius was a very ambitious young man compared to Laozi, the older person. Laozi said, if an honorable man is born at the right time so that there is an enlightened ruler that he can serve, then it is as if he is riding the wind. He can make progress with that. Finding the right ruler to serve, the enlightened, wise ruler who will listen. But on the other hand, if the honorable man is not born at the right time, there are no enlightened rulers to serve then he is simply blown around in random directions by the wind. There's no riding the wind. That being the case, he pointed out the futility of wanting something that perhaps did not exist. So he taught the Tao. And even after he left his position as the royal archivist, he continued to teach. He also taught Confucius um, about the Tao of humility. So Lao Tzu was a humble man. He practiced humility uh, just as he taught it. He practiced what he preached. He said to Confucius to the effect of, listen, a good merchant understands the importance of keeping precious goods hidden. So it is as if he has nothing in his hands. In a similar way, a man of honor presents a humble appearance as if he is a completely unremarkable individual. You, Confucius, you should work on removing the arrogance in you. Your attitude and ambitions will be of no help to you. That is all I can teach you. So he was very blunt and direct in speaking truthful words to Confucius. He made no attempt to dress them up as beautiful words. Those would sound good to Confucius, 
but they would not be true. Later on, Confucius, reflecting upon the wisdom of Lao Tzu, said to his disciples, Lao Tzu is like the dragon. What he meant by that was that Lao Tzu had attained a transcendental level of wisdom. Finally, Lao Tzu, the sage. It is important to realize that Lao Tzu described great sages of antiquity in the Tao Te Ching, but never once did he claim to be a sage himself. He talked about following what the sages did. The sages were humble, he remains humble. The sages were different from other people, he's becoming very different from other people, but he did not say, I am a sage. Other people, though, definitely recognized the wisdom in him. So Zhuangzi, another sage from that time period, was one of them. Zhuangzi described him as the foremost sage of his time. Unlike Confucius, Zhuangzi was not a contemporary of Laozi. So when Confucius met with Laozi, Confucius was much younger, was still in his prime, when Laozi was already the senior master. Zhuangzi came a century after Laozi was gone. He did not have personal interactions with Laozi. He still referred to Laozi as his teacher, his mentor, because he learned from what Laozi had taught, what he had written. So the three aspects of who he was he was a scholar, he was a teacher, he was a sage. Now there's much more to talk about. So for instance, we should talk about, well, what is this Tao that Lao Tzu kept talking about? What is the origin of Tao philosophy? There are misconceptions associated with that that we should clear up. How was the Tao Te Ching written? There's a legend associated with that. I wanted to share that with you. And most importantly, why should we study the Tao Te Ching? I wanted to give everybody my personal experience on why I decided to study the Tao Te Ching and why I think you should too. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.